Um, seriously though, there's a lot of exciting and juicy stuff ahead. And uh, I've got a great panel here. So uh, before I give you a little more of my thoughts and start asking some questions, I'll just let you know who we have. Um, here to my left, we have Mary Kimball, who from what I hear is really kind of one of the mover, movers and shakers in the Sacramento region. Um, she's the executive director of the Center for Land-Based Learning. And next to her, we have Oscar Villegas, who is a supervisor for Yolo County here. Sacramento's in Yolo County, correct? No. no. <laughs> Sorry. Sacramento County, Yolo County, right next to each other? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm showing my Central Valley ignorance of the Bay Area elite. Um, so then we have Thaddeus Barsati, co-owner of Farm Fresh to You. He and his two brothers run the farm. And you, Thaddeus, you're the, the underground farmer, correct? Yes. And you all have different roles. Okay. Um, next to Thaddeus, we have Keith Snop, the COO of Rayleigh's Family Fine Stores. Next to Keith, we have Tom Chan, the CEO of General Produce, which is local to Sacramento, correct? Uh, Northern California. North, all of Northern California, okay. And at the end of the row there, last but not least, we have Blake Young, the CEO of Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, so as most of you know, the food infrastructure here in California is, um, it's set up, everything from the roads to the trucks to the storage and processing facilities, it's really set up for efficiency, right? California is a very efficient producer of the, the nation's food as well as the a lot of the food that gets shipped around the globe. Um, but this incredibly rich region, it doesn't, the food produced here doesn't always make it to the residents in the immediate area. From what I've heard, only 2% of what is being produced locally is eaten locally. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that gap today. And um, because I work on a, a national scale, I'm always thinking about how what we're doing here in California compares to what's happening elsewhere. And I don't know if anyone followed the, the news a few weeks ago in Cal in New York, sorry, um, Andrew Cuomo announced he was allocating $15 million to a food hub in the South Bronx. But really a pretty exciting project. It's gonna, ideally at least, it's gonna provide local food for a lot more residents of New York City. And I've been thinking about that as preparing for this, as I was preparing for this panel because it doesn't appear that anything like that has shown up in Northern California or in Sacramento specifically. And it strikes me that this panel is really made up of folks who have found ways around that lack of big infrastructure. And it's, um, I've heard the word patchwork used a lot to describe what's happening here. Um, that it's, it's a number of kind of workarounds and ways that people have really getting creative to get this local food to consumers and to people who are, are hungry and need food more generally. So um, we're going to talk about some of that creativity. And I want to start with Thaddeus, the farmer. Can you tell us a little about um, what you perceive are kind of the, the biggest obstacles infrastructure-wise for, for farmers in this area? Sure. I think what one thing people don't realize is that uh, farmers do, people at this panel do, is crops are ready when they're ready. They don't, they don't wait. Um, and so when we want perfect fruits and vegetables or we want things a certain way, and as Americans we're kind of taught that that's how we get it, that's what we demand. And I think there's a big gap in matching you know, what nature is going to provide in timing and quality and perfectly supplying that to you know, all of you in, at the rate that you want to eat it. And I think that's really what uh, farmers markets are, are cool, are good for, is that you show up as a farmer and you have a local selection, and it's actually a really great infrastructure where, hey, I'm gonna sell something at the market every week, but I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm gonna give you my offering of what's local. And with Farm Fresh U, our CSA, that's really you know, why we did that was I could go to all of my customers and say, hey guys, I'm ready. Are you ready? And it was just too too long. But when farmers are able to have a sale and then fill it with the local produce, that's how we can definitely provide that. So I think that's probably 
you know, matching the, the supply and the demand is what infrastructure does, those inherently don't match week over week. Does it keep you up at night thinking about the potential for the food to go bad? <laughs> What's that? I said, does it keep you up at night? It would keep me up at night, just that thought of, I have so much food and will it actually get to the people in time? Yeah, the aged inventory of that report is a report we all know well. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> But I think it also creates a certain opportunity because this is really helpful, great food. And, you know, the irony of having a periods in my life when I couldn't give away a truckload of kale, I couldn't give away a truckload of heroin tomatoes if I wanted to, but you know that there are people, you know, within 90 miles of this farm who would really benefit from that product. You know, I think that's another component of the iron of the infrastructure is how do we really connect the supply and the demand, recognizing that there's a big demand for product, with not necessarily a demand behind it from the individual person. And so we're all set up to do it for money. So how do we do it in a bigger picture in society and think through the food system matching the, you know, like everybody who needs to eat? So Mary, um, I understand you've set up your own mini food hub, <laughs> or, or the Center for Land-Based Learning has. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of the, the need that you identified there and how you sought to begin to fill it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, Center for Land-Based Learning, runs a beginning farmer training program called the California Farm Academy. And then once they're done with their seven months, we also give them access to, to land because those are the, that's one of the biggest barriers, of course, to beginning farmers is access to land and access to capital. So we lease land from other folks, including cities like the city of West Sacramento, school districts, land that's gone unused. For many years, uh, Robert was talking about, you know, what do we already have and how do we make it better? Well, that's one of those kinds of unused potentials in many of our cities and jurisdictions is this land that's been sitting there not being productive. So we've been able to engage uh, with our beginning farmers, place them on that land, and give them the infrastructure thanks to different uh, companies that have helped us with this process, like Whaley's and Nugget, Bayer Crop Science, and others. But the problem there becomes, well, then where's the cooler for those farmers? Where they, they as as uh, as Daddy said so well, when things are ready and they're ready to harvest, well, they need to be harvested. They need to be sold. And if you do not have cold storage as a small beginning farmer, and you don't have the money to do that yourself, how do we how do we do that as a community? And so we're pretty set up in this region for large scale, right? For large, where they're general produce or uh, you know, there, of course, KP Organic Farm Fresh U, but the smaller scale aggregation facilities are few and far between. So we were able to, to put together a grant, and actually um, that grant came from California Freshworks Fund, literally to buy a cooler. To buy a cooler that is in the back of a brewery, Yolo Brewery in West Sacramento, thank you to them, for allowing us to be there with seven days a week of opportunity for the farmers to come in and bring their produce. So yeah, we cre had to create, uh, we had to be creative, we had to work with a lot of partners, and we had the blessing of the city, uh, which isn't always the case as well, uh, to be able to do that. So you started to mention a partnership with Rayleigh's, which might be a good transition. Um, Keith, do you want to talk a little bit about what Rayleigh's is doing to, to get local produce into your stores? and? and how you've worked with Center for Land-Based Learning and other folks. I know you have your own nonprofit. Yeah, sure. Um, we fortunately operate in, in an area of the country, perhaps in the world, that you know the, the perfect place to, to really do something better or different in, uh, on this topic, because of proximity to growers and to be fortunate to be a retailer in Northern California. What Thaddeus mentioned, what Mary mentioned, uh, we're very connected to that. Uh, we have uh, a commitment to urban farming, um, where a product is grown and then delivered directly to the store, uh, right down the street, and, and sold to, to customers, hopefully at an affordable price. And uh, we have a local 50 program with over 70 uh, participants in Northern California, just on produce alone. Um, where those products are just that. They are grown and sourced and delivered directly by the farmer to the store without going through the added cost and time of moving that product to a, a processing plant onto a distribution center 
and then delivered to store, which adds days, which takes away from the quality and freshness. It adds cost, which has to be absorbed by someone. And uh, uh, we're really fortunate that we have those partnerships, and we see that as a bigger part of how we do business going forward. It is, it is core to Life Teal and the Rayleigh family's belief on how we serve uh, the customers and the people uh, in our community. Uh, that's further evident in the Food for Families program. To date, we've given away $34 million and almost the exact same pounds of food. And, and uh, you heard the opening remarks that that food is, is, is now fresh. It is about fruits and vegetables and, and dairy products, including milk is really important to the health and nutrition people who don't have access or, or, or can't afford the quality of food that everyone is deserving of. And just to drill down quickly, what percentage would you say of your produce department is local and are you how are you identifying that food? Uh, in season, I would say nearly 100% of our produce is local. There are always products that, that the climate just isn't conducive to grow and we'll always source bananas you know, outside of California for obvious reasons. But where there is a local option, that is our first and go-to. And uh, it is not important to Rayleigh's if that is the most cost efficient. Um, we're a local family-owned company and we believe in the community and giving back to the community and supporting them. That's good business and it's the right thing to do, so it works out really well. So, so Tom, you're in the business of of getting some, a lot of this produce to the people who need to eat it fast enough. And can you tell us a little bit about the challenges that you face in doing that? Well, we look at ourselves as probably a, a, a traditional food hub because what we do is we <coughs> aggregate product, we source product, we aggregate it, uh, we store it, and then we transport it. And can you give, give us a sense of the scale, just how much and how many farms Ooh, you know, it depends on the time of year. I mean, if, if you go back to uh, my grandfather's time, I mean, before third generation business, he started the business in 1933, uh, virtually all of our suppliers were local farmers. You know, unfortunately, a lot of them have gone by the wayside. Uh, so it, it, it's hard to say. And then, and then, of course, when you talk about local, the big question is what do you consider local? I mean, what Keith considers local may be different from what Mary considers local or any or what Thaddeus considers. So I would say it, at any given time it could be a hundred or more local farmers because you know it, it's, it's I don't know what the exact number is but essentially what we do is is we source from local growers <coughs> and then we we deliver it to uh, supermarkets uh, restaurants uh, schools and and a lot of these are in outlying areas so I mean I think that that what 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 we provide to the growers. Uh, it's like what Thaddeus said, it, it, what the, one of the issues for the growers is really most growers are not quite like, like his business. I mean, they, most growers simply want to grow product. They don't want to be in the transportation business and they don't want to be in the finance business. So, so the, the service that we provide in the chain is that we will source the product from the local growers. We will bring the product into our facility and we'll pay them right away. I mean, most farmers, that's, that's what they want to do. They just want to grow great quality, safe product. They want to get it to the market as fast as they can, and they want to get it out as fast as they can. And basically, that is our role. Great. Um, so, moving down to, to Blake, can you tell us a little bit about the challenge? I mean, you have one really core challenge, which is that people are hungry, and that's, that's big. But in terms of the infrastructure and really sort of moving some of this food from, say, a grocery store or a farmer's market or even direct, directly from a farm in some cases. What are, what are some of the big challenges that you face infrastructure-wise? Well, the infrastructure challenge we face is very similar to everyone here. Um, so we, Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services is the hub for this region. Uh, we have about 220 agencies that we supply food to the end user, even though we're still in uh, the end user business. Um, and we just recently took this on as of the end of December, December of 2014. Our biggest challenge uh, is on the sourcing side, we have a lot of partners, you see three of them here, we wouldn't be in business uh, if it wasn't for Thaddeus or Rayleigh's or Tom, but um, you know, our, our biggest challenge infrastructure-wise is that the charities or food 
closets or food lockers or churches that supply food to the end user, um, lower income families, uh, don't have cold storage, um, have transportation challenges. So um, typical of regional food banks, which we just became, if you look across the country, Chicago, New York, San Diego, um, they have worked 20 years to try to increase the infrastructure for some of these end user facilities. So right now our biggest uh, issue is, is we are sourcing 33% of the product that we provide to the community, 20 million pounds. Uh, we have challenges getting it to the end user and having it stored. So we have, it's just in time. Uh, so our goal is to increase uh, cold storage first, transportation second to get it out. And then we're also funded by the Regional Foundation recently to look at the emergency food system and work with outside consultants to really look at what is the most efficient and effective way to feed. There's 244,000 people in Sacramento County that are food insecure. Through our network, we're serving about 135,000. So there's, almost, there's 100,000 folks, uh, and we don't know for what reasons yet why they're not accessing uh, food banks or food closets, but our hope is, is that through our partnerships that we can source more and get it out there more efficiently. I'm hearing from everyone that cold storage is the hot topic of 2016. People we can create a hashtag. Um, so, Oscar, you're in a position to try to address some of these challenges. I know you're you're identifying them yourself, but what are you doing? What are you What are you looking towards? What are your What are your goals as a policymaker? Sure. I, I think it's uh, first of all. I think I'm, I'm uh, I feel absolutely privileged to be able to represent the only county has a long uh, history of being very, very thoughtful about its preservation of ag land and, um, and promoting agriculture in, in the best possible way. Um, and we're sort of sitting on a gold line, if you will, in the whole county. Um, I think as a policymaker, um, it's critically important that we uh, understand what the barriers are that exist for things like that. Uh, the things that we've been discussing all morning and, and into the afternoon. I think part of it is understanding Part of it is establishing rapport and trust with the folks that are on the ground that are actually making uh, the systems work. Um, and then recognizing where we can be helpful and where we ought to stay out, right? So the elected officials, oftentimes, we have a tendency to want to um, fix things that maybe aren't broken, um, and maybe not so much wanting to fix things that, um, that we shouldn't be. And so I think understanding the differences and where we can be helpful, where we can be probably harmful, uh, is sort of that first step. And I, and I think the best way to do that is to participate and be a part of these kinds of conversations where we're um, hearing a lot of very thought-provoking ideas, uh, concerns, um, and some of the barriers that exist. Uh, we have a tremendous opportunity, but we have challenges uh, in, our, in our food system and the entire infrastructure network and how we get uh, food from one place to another, how we feed the people that are hungry at the end of the day. So we have a lot of challenges. Um, but I think for us, it's important understand the issues and try to work with folks to come up with solutions rather than uh, feeling as if it's, it's our responsibility to know the answer to these, these complex questions. Can you give me, just to follow up on that quickly, you said to stay out, you are interested in sort of staying out of the way, are there, is there an example that you, that comes to your mind of a time that a policymaker has been too much in people's way when it comes to creating infrastructure for local food? Um, I think we've been very fortunate in Yolo County to not get too involved. I think that there, that there are uh, very smart and creative people that are actually uh, feeding the system right now in Yolo. And so nothing comes to mind as an example quite yet, it's much later, but I think we're very fortunate in Yolo County given all of the players that are participating uh, that we have a very good system in place right now. I can give the opposite, <laughs> which, is as if, which is a jurisdiction that, that helped kind of stayed out of the way, mm -hmm. which is the city of West Sacramento. And people know, I, I always am touting the city of West Sacramento as one that, that um, set up a framework, really. They, they did the, the hard work to listen. They listened, they talked to the community members. They they looked at their zoning. They did all of these, they, they learned uh, that there is this issue with access to land for beginning farmers and how could they help support beginning farmers in the region. So they literally changed their zoning so that uh, all residential, commercial, even industrial areas could have crop production by right. Now, 
that is very unique. Um, they just did it. You know, they did that, and then they then they started working with our organization as well as many others to say, okay, we don't know the other parts of the system. We don't really understand agriculture. We don't understand um, how to get farmers farming and how to support them. But we've cleared the way, so to speak, for you to be successful. And I think that's really what Oscar is speaking to, is rather than putting up barriers to you know, let yet another layer of, of, of whether it's bureaucracy or however you want to define it, it is kind of the opposite. It's removing some of those layers of bureaucracy so that good things can happen by, again, to Robert's point, people and activities and things and, and resources that are already there. Um, so it's letting those things come to life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about the greenhouse. I read, is that is that related to the what you're talking about with West Sacramento, the bigger greenhouse that was built there? There's a $80 million investment in a research lab and 2,000 square foot greenhouse in West Sacramento. Was that, did that happen before or after this? Were they, were they related at all? Was that part of the drive in West Sacramento to, to change this policy? Do you know? Um, you know, I, I think what, what um, we're very fortunate to have in Nolan County is we have, um, for example, in West Sacramento, uh, West Sacramento, although it's, it's been supportive, and I was on the council, we're very supportive of urban farming. We also know that the urbanization of the city is what the county is trying to impress upon that. So the county has sort of remained at some dog camp. And then moved a lot of the, or has supported a lot of the uh, urbanization within the city sphere. And so the city has promoted uh, uh, mid size, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, other types of uses rather than trying to duplicate what the county's been doing. And so the city's actually had a very aggressive policy in attracting this, these types of businesses because of its location, because of the water, because of the ability to process applications quickly. So it, it has served that niche very well. Okay. Um, so Back to Thaddeus, and really I'm curious to hear what other folks have to say about this on a macro level. I'm just, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the decision to, to do a lot of your own infrastructure. And when we're talking about, um, you know, whether or not local food producers should try to kind of work into the larger stream of conventional food production, or whether they should do their own thing and, and create their own infrastructure. Um, I, I, we have examples of, of all of that here, I think, there's a, of a spectrum, and you're probably the one doing something alternative. Sure. You're the furthest on that spectrum. I'm curious your, about your thoughts. So our decision was made out of uh, necessity. We inherited a farm and almost went bankrupt in a hurry. It was pretty easy to do farming. <laughs> and we, the first thing we did was invested in uh, cold storage, and what was happening was we just weren't competing with the rest of the industry. And you know, then we invested in our own logistics, and we invested in our own sales team, and then we, you know, it was a very organic process. You know, we bought in delivery drivers and you know, warehousemen and, and all of those things. And so to date, now when I look at the infrastructure that we have, you know, we're in Yolo County probably have only Hyperback, which is a awesome piece of machinery that cools vegetables from 90 degrees to 36 degrees in 45 minutes and does it full time. It's a very impressive piece. <laughs> and you know there are, we have a big fancy pick light station um, because we offer our customers a seasonal selection but we understand that at the end of the day customers don't want to be told what they're going to eat but they do want to have a local selection made and we employ a local philosophy that says hey when we make our box you know we pick the best local 30 things but we make sure there's always greens there's always this and always that and so the biggest complaint was they're saying if you send me another bulb of fennel and pound of bok choy, I'm going to quit and I'm going to find out where you live. And, and, but I love growing bok choy. It's so fun to grow. It's easy. It yields well. It's easy to harvest. And it tastes good for the first five times. But, so what we ended up figuring out was, hey, we have to give people more choices. And so people are happy with bok choy until they're not, and then they want to change it out. And so we just we built this whole infrastructure. And I think one of the things that strikes me about the point at, at which we are in the food system is that for millions of years, as a society, we've been learning how to do this. And it evolved from first we grew food and 
hated ourselves. And then we, no, first we were running around chips to get food everywhere. Then we started growing food. And then society grew up, and civilization grew up, and we had you know, people like General Produce who were aggregators of food and retailers who would then work with them to offer it to the consumer. And then when the technology hit in 2000, everybody used the technology to make that same connection better. But what we were forced to do was say, hey, let's use the technology to rewrite the whole, rewire the whole thing. So now my planting schedule isn't based on what grocery stores are buying. It's based on the take rate of bok choy of my customers. And my overall thought is that the best thing that we can do is learn from people like our company and other innovative companies and get those companies to start offering those services. So you know, did I want to build all that infrastructure? No. You know, I would much prefer to much have preferred to be able to pay for a cooling service or pay for the right delivery service. But the reality was is none of that existed. But I think now that we know what it looks like, there's a big opportunity opportunity to ask every individual in society, hey, where do you participate in the food system? Because everyone does, whether they're a buyer, like a consumer, or an advocate, or a distributor, or a grower, or an aggregator. And how do we get all of those people lined up and say, hey, here's a food system we all want, and let's piggyback on, you know, why, why should Mary have to go and build a, an aggregation facility when I have one and I know how to pack a box? Probably better than, you know, Mary does now. You might, you know, you might be the careful. <laughs> I don't want to challenge you. That's not a challenge, Mary. But I think there's a lot of opportunity in how we take the infrastructure, and instead of everyone trying to reinvent the wheel and say, hey, look how cool this is, let's learn from Regals, let's learn from General, let's learn from Blake and what he's done, let's learn from us, let's learn from Mary, let's learn from the policymakers, and take the best of all of those and say, hey, here's what success looks like, and go for it. Yeah, and if you don't mind if I can build on that, I completely agree. I, I think we're gonna see an acceleration of that, and I think regional retailers such as ourselves be able to integrate and, and leverage the infrastructure that the stores and our distribution systems already have in partnership with, with people like Thaddeus and, and others who are like-minded. And the economics of that are going to become more clear. And there's an imperative. And that imperative is being driven by, there's a shift, and it's happening faster and faster in terms of what people want, in terms of quality, in terms of fresh, of what's in their food, and equally important, what's not. And as that shift changes the economics based on customer demand, um, it's going to require all aspects of the supply chain, particularly on the retailer's behalf, um, to be more agile, to be faster to market, to take costs out of the supply chain so that food is affordable. And, and I think that the customer is going to help this become a reality faster. And, and I think this area of the country is going to lead the way. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I think that um, you know, the infrastructure of the past, which is you do your part and hand it off, and the next part happens, and then the next, and the next, and eventually gets on the shelf and into the, in, into the uh, hand of the customer. Uh, all that's going to become more uh, seamless more integrated, more connected, and it will help growers anticipate demand better. It will help growers prepare and deliver food when it's ready and leverage the infrastructure uh, of the retail distribution point to either directly put it to shelf or to hold it until it is ready. And it is that infrastructure that's then gonna play into helping people in food deserts or people who are food insecure those points of distribution, those stores, are, are close to where those people live in many cases. Uh, we just got to figure out now how to fill in the urban, you know, portion of that equation. But uh, uh, that's the kind of work that Mary and others are hoping to solve. So we've mostly been talking about private money here, and there is a public good piece of this in terms of feeding people and training beginning and, and new farmers. And I'm wondering. Uh, I mean, I think you probably, many of you will probably have opinions on this, but what's the appropriate place along that spectrum? You know, who should really be paying for this infrastructure? Should it be, should, should some of it be coming from our, our public dollars, as, is, as is, is the case in New York City right now? Um, or should it be uh, mostly a private enterprise? 
I have a really strong opinion on that. Imagine that. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's not wrong, but it's a higher risk when you ask a government agency or public money to fix a problem by actually fixing the problem, like by building a food hub or doing that. And I think a more appropriate way to fix these problems is to define what that definition of success is, which is saying certain people are fed, they're fed a certain way, from grown, food grown a certain way, and to take that money and put it at the, at the end of it. What I'm saying is like have that money buy that service and let that money flow back to whoever is doing it and let them use that money to build the infrastructure they need as opposed to you know, thinking that as smart as a group of government officials are, that they're gonna sit down and spend the money perfectly. Right? But if you put the money where you want it and you say, hey, we wanna put a you know, million dollars feeding this 115,000 people that Blake talked about and we want them to be fed with a local philosophy, meaning when local produce is good and available, we want to use that, and we want to make sure they get number two product when that's available. And we define that success and we put the money there. There's going to be people jumping all over the place to, to, to solve that, and that money is going to then automatically make the infrastructure that we need. But nobody yet really knows what it looks like. And if it did, if we did, we would have probably built it by now. Could I add something to my last Yeah, please. See, I think that the, you know, what that is is really is complementary to what General Hurd and what Bat Food Bank is. I mean, in that he's a little different than most growers because he was willing to take the risk, invest the capital in building an infrastructure where he could, you know, he could actually uh, sell to or distribute to to the public. Um, I mean, we're already, you know, most. Of, I would assume. I think most growers really are quite different from him. You know, they 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 either they don't have the capital or they don't have the know-how, they really just don't want to get into this whole distribution piece. Whereas we're already in the distribution piece. So the thing is this is, is, is to some extent, you know, going after public money to build food hubs, in a way I look at it is, is, is we're somewhat reinventing the wheel because there are many existing food hubs, General Produce, Sack Food Bank, all in the United States you have a food hub, organization like ours that, that already have that infrastructure built up. I mean, you know, getting back to the original question you asked me, the biggest challenge we have is lack of labor, that's number one, and the cost, the physical, the cost of physical distribution, which is huge. I mean, we're talking about storage and, and trucking and all that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I believe that a lot of the infrastructure already exists now. Now, we can talk about how local farmers feed into that or how, how, how we can get that product out to these food deserts and, and underutilized areas, right? I believe a lot of the infrastructure already exists. So I think if I could build on your question, I, a big part of solving this is creating demand through education around better quality food. The industry for a long time, and Rarely has been part of that, has been built and driven by a function, a focus on processed food, ultra processed food. It's cheap, it's efficient, Supply chain really knows how to do that well. And people have been taught that that's a good nutritional alternative. We need to shift the narrative around the quality and, and the health and, and the impact that food has on your wellness and well-being. And through that education, as people want more of that, as they seek that out, you know, that demand will help solve this problem. So if there's an investment made by someone outside the industry, it should be on education, transparency in packaging, and education so that consumers have the right information to make better choices. And that will work its way through the, the industry and drive demand, which then will help solve the economic challenges of what we're Okay, well, so just to be devil's advocate for a minute. Sure. If we look at the organics industry, and I know we're not necessarily equating local and organics here. They're separate and complicated overlapping areas. Organics has grown insanely. The demand is there. We know that. It's growing largely every year, and yet the infrastructure is missing. So what's happening is the companies are importing ingredients from outside of the U.S. That, so 
we, we know we have demand for a certain type of food. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm just, I question a little bit of the supply and demand, the simplicity of the supply and demand philosophy, because I think it may take more than just educating people about demand. Yeah, and you know, organic versus non-organic is one level of complex discussion. Candy bar versus apple is a different level of discussion. What I'm describing is that. Mm -hmm. Shifting the, the education around food to an education that's based on nutrition. And as you do that, the demand for fresh, quality, healthier, better for you products will go up. Because that's what people will demand. Curing is the future. Right. And, and that 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 economic that that economic shift will, through demand, create efficiencies in the supply chain because it's a lot easier if you can produce a lot of something versus a little of something. And and that's when I say, you know, there's a shift that I, I think will help. And if there's an education with the customer around nutrition, not food. We're all going to be healthier, and the, the business of producing and selling food is going to become more efficient when it comes to healthier, natural, farm-raised products versus older processed. So, Blake, I just want to your your sign down there, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts about the the public-private spectrum here. What's the role of, of public money and private money in, in feeding people in this area? Well, I think. I think it's a combination of both. I mean, for us, our job now is to try to get food to folks, but one of, we're trying to also inspire people to be healthy. I mean, we do really believe that food is medicine, and the folks that we serve are suffering greatly from diet-related illnesses, so um, education is a huge piece of that. Uh, it's also, I believe we are becoming a part of the overall food system because we're creating consumers by educating and providing this better food. Um, but again, there's a huge challenge for us because, if the, again, timing. So if we buy or get donated food from these three, um, on the donated side, I mean, our challenge is to get out as quickly as possible because once it's donated, not all the time, but a lot of times it's, it's towards the end of its life. You're trying to inspire folks to eat better. You don't want to give them a crappy apple. You want to give them a crisp, good-looking apple. And so food banks have changed um, greatly in terms of becoming partners with retailers and wholesalers and farmers and opening their wallets. Uh, and if you look across big, big food banks um, across the country, they're, they're not outside of the food system. You know, they're, big, they're a big part of it. And uh, in terms of consumerism, I mean, the more education we do uh, in the population is will inspire, again, folks to go to the grocery store to consider um, eating healthier, going to the farmer's markets. On the, on the policy side, uh, folks can access CalFresh benefits. A lot of people don't realize what an economic multiplier that is, but also uh, folks that are receiving uh, CalFresh or food stamps are able to go and get sometimes double the amount of food. I mean, there's a great effort going on. On the private side, we would not be where we are without help from the private side, no question about it. I think moving forward, if we're going to tackle the big gap in the food insecure, whether it's in Sacramento County or others, uh, we'll need government officials. And, and, and in my opinion, some government funding, maybe at the local level, in general funds, uh, rather than just think about combating crime, think about what uh, the food, in, what what food insecurity brings on as a result of people being hungry. Eighty thousand people in Sacramento County, below the age of fifteen, are suffering from food insecurity. That's ridiculous. In the most bountiful, uh, growing region in the world. So. So you started the question about with New York, and, and I and I took a look at that too. And unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of time to read into it. I was really intrigued by that chunk of money that has, has been uh, put into the food hub. There's been a lot of work here done around food hubs and what they need. And, and one argument I will make actually is that, um, you know, SACOG and the Lux program and Valley Vision together did an incredible job of, of putting together kind of the model food hub, uh, two different locations, one in Winters, one in, in Yuba City, and how that should be structured. 
because it's not just whole food. It's also about light processing. We do not have that here. So the aggregation is one thing, like our little small food hub that we've created. But the demand side is also asking for, whether it's the schools or it's the hospitals or it's the other institutional buyers, they're asking for some of that light processing. So cut and shop. Right? The things that DC Kitchen, LA Kitchen have been doing, others as well. We actually don't have that here. So where does public money come in into that conversation, especially when it's around the greater public good, like feeding our children, like feeding people in hospitals, and so on? You know, I, I do think there's a role, and, and I appreciate your point, Blake, about is there general fund money that should be going into some of these things versus, I mean, we all care about crime prevention, we all care about police and our firefighters, and so on. Of course, then those things have to be funded. But are there other ways that we can be thinking more creatively about how important food is to all the rest of the pieces of the puzzle in terms of our communities? And so that's where I do think, you know, we've done the work, and it's been great work, and it's been presented, and so far, we haven't had the private investment into that. So does it take some nudge from public money? Maybe it does. Maybe th that this is one of those things that needs to be that public-private partnerships partnership that tend to be so incredibly valuable as we've been talking about today. If I can add on to that, Sean Harrison and I have been talking to Soil Warm Farms for probably a decade about a healthy food fund. It totally makes sense. And if we're talking about 200 and almost 250,000 people uh, suffering from food insecurity, you're talking about people that are less productive, children that are not learning and not focused. And you're talking about investing in our future leaders. I mean, if we're going to start anywhere, quite frankly, you want to talk about crime rate? The crime rate is a direct result, more than likely, of, the, uh, of young children being food insecure, uh, among other things. But the Healthy Food Fund, it, it just makes good sense. I, I know it's not easy, Oscar, no doubt. But it just seems very basic uh, that we would look in that direction as we're looking for ways to improve our society. Yeah, do you want to make one more comment, and then we're going to go to some questions from the audience. Let's go. You can, okay. go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to chime in. I mean, I think, I think part of the, 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 the struggle, um, we have multiple, multiple competing interests, like policy objectives for a, a, a small, uh, predominant agricultural kind of electric railroad. And the preservation, the long-term preservation of, of ag land comes at a cost. Uh, we don't get to just preserve ag and then generate revenue by some other means overnight. That, that comes at a cost of preserving the land that otherwise could be converted to other higher risk energy uses. And so, despite the fact that we all want to make sure that we have sufficient food, and nobody would ever refute that, again, we go back to our premise of preserving open space and animals for that long-term sustainability. So, um, so can you just tease that out just a little bit? So, how does preserving ag land shift that? How does it deprioritize the other piece? It doesn't deprioritize. What it does is it, it, it now has number two number one priorities, right? I mean, I think our, our county has. Taken a very long term. But don't those aggressive. could those two go hand in hand? They could absolutely mm -hmm. with partnership, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't have the capacity as a county government to step in and tell that, sorry, we know that you would love to have be creative about your approach of cold storage and being able to you know have a small organic farm and then co contribute to the problem. We're going to take it over as a government. We'll manage. We'll manage. We know that's going to be doubly more expensive. We know that just that's just a given. And so we have to be partnering with, with other private jump in to say, well, we'll just manage it, I think is, uh, is premature. And I think we need to have partnerships in these sort of, uh, to address these sort of issues in a long, sustainable way. Um, you know, okay. Does anyone in the audience have a question for our panelists? I saw a hand go up <coughs> over on that side of the room first, but there are a number of you, so we'll try to get to it. Hi, this is Kat Bass again from Briar Patch. Um, I had a question for Mr. Knopf regarding his comment on education. Um, where does the basis for our education come from? Is it just the FDA? Because it, it kind of makes me worry. Um, I read a, a book by Michael Pollan um, called Food Matters, and it, it basically talks about over history how we've taken a lot of guidance from the FDA and government um, agencies 
educating us about food, and we had things happen like hydrogenated oils and trans fat and things that, you know, margarine, not butter, it's better for you. Come to find out these things are causing diseases like cancer. So when you say education, where are we pulling this education from as a food system unit? And how can we take that education and put it into access for people, not just educating? I think that, that's a fantastic question. I, I think it is at the, the cornerstone of the issue uh, within the food industry. Um, and I think the answer might sound cliche is everyone involved in the supply chain, from the grower to the retailer, including agencies, need to be transparent. We need to allow the science to be presented in a way. And it's not for us, at least as retailers, to make choices for people. But as that point of decision, the labeling on the packaging, the labeling on the shelf, clarity around the ingredients, what's in and what is not, how we use information online and in the store it is very important to helping people have the information to make a better choice. It's also incumbent on us as retailers, particularly at Raley's, we are focused on and we'll see changes where we place certain foods in the store. For example, we remove soda from the checkout stand. We still sell soda, but we made a decision that that is not the right place when somebody's making an impulse decision to put an ultra-sugary beverage easily as an option. And water and teas are a better solution. So it, the, the question is incredibly complicated. It, I think it is the exact right question. It is going to take effort from everyone, uh, and, and it's going to take a very deliberate and transparent effort from every aspect of the supply chain, retailer to grower and agency, to help solve this. And it's going to take some time. But it has to start with truth. I don't know where the microphone is. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> uh, this gentleman in the front raised his hand. Red, red hand. I'm Mark Zauder, expert for the org. We certainly feel Blake's pain in terms of coming up against the uh, constraints of infrastructure and the charitable food distribution system. And so my question is to the panelists, what have you seen or can you imagine in terms of innovation, innovative solutions to this problem? Could Rayleigh's and other stores share unused refrigerated refrigeration capacity with local food pantries? Could food banks share foundation grant sources with money to create more uh, storage and the people to staff those organizations to di distribute the, the food. Uh, county governments making similar grants. What have you seen or, or could you imagine that could uh, solve, help to solve this problem? Well, you, te you teed it up pretty well. I, <laughs> I, I mean, we were lucky enough to receive I, this may be a long-winded answer. I'll try to be short. We, we were lucky enough to receive a grant recently from Sutter Health to do that exact thing, um, which was provide grant funding to our agencies, uh, not to dictate what exactly they needed, because it's not just cold storage. It's also uh, technology. It's also transportation. Um, we, we hope to grow that. So I think there's foundations here um, that are interested in helping us. I mean, Rayleigh's, Tom, Thaddeus, I mean, they've all helped in many ways um, when we took on uh, the big infrastructure that we uh, did just recently. I mean, I told Thaddeus we're still getting our sea legs. We have the private industry that has offered help. Uh, we're, you know, we, we weren't logistical experts. I mean, we were a, a large agency, but when you become a regional food hub, uh, for their emergency food system or their food system as a whole, there's a lot of efficiency challenges that, and compliance challenges that we weren't ready. Uh, so the private industry has certainly helped us um, get to where we are now, and they've opened uh, their arms to continue to do that. I, 
I said earlier, we have the same, almost the same exact challenges as, as the bigger system, which really is capacity. Um, I, I think you know, we want to feed 100,000 more people. If there's, again, a quarter million people are food insecure, we're only reaching 135,000. That's a huge gap. So we're in no way do we feel we know how to do that uh, perfectly. So we're going to rely on a lot of industry experts to help us get there. But again, it, it is, uh, I mean, in charitable work, it's not just infrastructure. You need volunteerism. Um, you, you need um, investments in inventory and uh, facilities. Uh, so um, we'll look to these guys and some others to, to try to do that. But we're just blessed to have the support to be able to, to trickle down the money. Uh, and that's what true regional food banking is, which again, we're an infant at, so we'll, we'll continue to get uh, going on that. And your comments about retailers, uh, I can't speak for others, I can only speak for uh, what's driving you know, behind the purpose at Rayleigh's, and, and, and we have done some things, we'll do more. Uh, the fact that we have the existing infrastructure, we have over 300 tractor trailers, we have warehouse, freezer operations. We have points of distribution in most major cities and towns in Northern California and Western Nevada. So how to leverage those, you know, that's I think one of the benefits of this panel and, and this kind of farm tank thinking is it, it inspires us all. It certainly inspires myself and I know Mike Teal, our owner, to, to figure out how to do more. And if anybody has a tractor trailer out there, they'd like to give us yeah. a yeah. <laughs> refrigerated truck. We'll take that. Right. I, I do want to bring up workforce, though. Uh, we, we haven't actually talked about workforce at all, but infrastructure, you know, we got to talk about workforce. Who's going to be doing all of these jobs that we're talking about? And that that is a, a, a big issue in agriculture. Um, not just farm labor, which is a huge issue at, at, the, at the farm side, the production side, but there's a 40% gap in this country between the people that are graduating from the colleges of ag, food and ag around the country, and the numbers of jobs out there in ag. And those are, for the most part, not on the farm jobs. They're all the things that we're talking about here. You mean 40% more jobs? There's 40% more jobs than there are people graduating. <laughs> you know, and this is this is this is even greater, of course, in many of our rural areas where people want to leave and they don't see themselves staying there because they don't see themselves getting, they don't see the opportunity goes back to the education question. How do we engage people in this industry in a way that's exciting and new and different? And we've been hearing today about how many incredible things there are from a technological standpoint, from a logistics standpoint, to the ability to marry you know, the, those, those, those things that people are so excited about doing, helping their community with food production, with food access, with food literacy, all of these things. There's a ton of jobs out there. And we all need to be working together also, and all of us here are as well, to, to help in, increase people's knowledge of and, and experience in those kinds of opportunities so that we can get more young people into this work, so that we can all find solutions together. All right, let's take one more from the audience, and then I have a couple here. Um, woman here in the front. My name is Quincy Gonzalez, and I'm a student at River City High School. I'm actually um, the president of our FFA program, and I do go to school at the Bright Off campus. So that's called CAFE. And I'd just like to thank you guys for having um, invested your time into that program. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have is, how do we get the information from here? How do we get the students to the bigger picture of what you guys are saying here at our school. So what can what can I do to bring you guys there? Is that your program? So just okay. to, yeah. So it's uh, first of all, thank you for coming because that's the first step. Um, so the the culinary academy that uh, she's referring to uh, is a um, joint venture that was spearheaded by the Washington Public School District in West Sacramento to create literally a state-of-the-art culinary academy for students to understand uh, all aspects of food service industries, 
serving the whole, everything you can imagine. The students are as good as, I believe it was one point, maybe 100 kids enrolled in the program. And so the kids are actually learning and getting excited about opportunities that exist in our region. Um, and the whole spectrum of, of the food industry uh, from one sector to the other. Um, so I guess to, to answer your question, advice, because mm -hmm. I think that's the best opportunity for us as elected officials to see your excitement about the industry and the potential, because you're now in that, I mean, if you're, if you're studying that, you're, you know, you're part of that, that, uh, that, um, that work, uh, we have to listen. We, that, that is how we are gonna learn by, by seeing you excited about the prospects and what that industry might provide you in, in the future. And so um, as elected officials, being invited to actually see what's happening makes it much more real. Um, so I would start with that. And I can put Rayleigh on the spot. I know, I know that literally just a couple weeks ago, um, because you guys have assisted us, many of your students assisted us with the dinner at the barn in West Sacramento, um, this gentleman right down here said, how can we connect to that program? So you being out in the community, you being a part of these activities, and asking. Right, I mean, that is critical. I think anybody that I know in the agriculture industry, when they get asked to say, hey, can you come to our school? Can you talk about what you do and how it impacts us and, and help us learn? Thrilled to be able to, to do that for you. Yeah. I'll tell you some of the things that we do with the school districts that we work with. Uh, Elk Grove School District, for example, will actually go out into the, go out into the, into the school and they'll have events We'll set up things that we've done. We've set up little mini farmers markets. Uh, we have games for the kids. We'll, we'll have them sample different types of fresh produce, which which they may not, might otherwise never have sampled before. And, and we find that you know that's 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 a, a big piece of, of this whole food solution is, is starting with the kids. And to the extent that we can uh, expose them to more, get them excited about it, make it fun uh, at, at that level. Uh, we, we want to do our part, so I would I would suggest uh, I mean if there if, you, if there are organizations or the schools that you're working with you're getting produce from somewhere uh, if those if those suppliers will come out I mean there's there's many many resources I mean for us to do this it's not it's not real expensive for us to do it I mean it's it's more a matter of, of knowing what the school wants and kind of coordinating the event and then just doing it I think so I grew up on a farm organic farm and our cooler was always filled with produce. Like my mom, there's nothing to eat on this farm. <laughs> I'd say the cooler is filled with produce. What are you talking about? However, I am uh, embarrassed to admit it wasn't until I got to college that I knew how to successfully saute vegetables or roast them at 450 degrees in olive oil until it tastes good. <laughs> and I think something that I'm sure you all think about a lot is like what percentage of Americans can feed themselves with fresh produce? And I think the number is shockingly lower than if we were to pull this group. And so my tip to you and all schools is make sure kids know how to saute vegetables and roast them. Because that's a tool they're going to use the rest of their life. And it's a tool that no matter what fresh food they get, they're going to be able to alter it into a healthy, healthful form if they know how to do that. local growers revenue. So I interpret, I, I don't know that their wording is exactly helpful here, but I interpret what they're saying um, to mean that they're, they want to understand how, if and how the advancements in infrastructure and the, the fact that so much more local food may be getting into say Rayleigh's, really, really how is that impacting the, the bottom line for farmers? And I'm curious about that too. Does, does um, we have one idea of the farmer's market as sort of the pure market for farmers that and they can just make the dollar, the money directly from the food that they're selling and that it, it sort of shifts as it, it moves more into the, the mainstream food stream. So I'm just wondering if anyone has thoughts they want to share about how this is, how infrastructure impacts the bottom line for farmers. You can, on average, <laughs> knows this number. If you pay two dollars for something at the store, a dollar of that went back to the grower. 
and that other dollar didn't get put in anyone's pocket. It's very expensive to run a retail operation or even to do farmer's markets. Like we tend to make can make more money selling the wholesale accounts than running the farmer's market because there's so much overhead that goes into it. And my big point is that when we get Grayley and General Produce and Nugget and these stores to hear from consumers that California produce is better and put a demand on that. Then well, should we say not just California produce, right? But no, I'm saying specifically in this example of what okay. I'm going to say is California produce. Because I don't think people understand how easy it is for product to come up from Mexico or across from Arizona or down from Oregon, where the, the labor laws are extremely different. And if you don't support the California produce, then you really have no chance of encouraging any of the system to keep those local farms in business. And so, you know, the, how you spend money, whatever you spend the money on, that practice that you spend your money on is, is going to be better. And so the big thing is just you know, knowing where your product comes from and knowing that it's right. And that will, you know, these guys know when, huh. when they're buying something that a farmer is not losing money on. Yeah, or losing money. Right. In, in terms of paying the bill, um, the farmer gets to keep more of it. A broker is not involved. Transportation costs and handling are far less. It allows us to price better quality food that's more affordable, and the farmer keeps more uh, uh, as a result of those cost items being less, or in some cases not at all. So uh, the more of that that happens, the better for everyone involved. Better for the retailer, most importantly, better for the customer, and equally important for the customer, better for the farmer. So it, it, it's a it's a great model, and we need to do more of it. From our for, for our small farmers, um, you know, obviously the addition of literally a cooler, right? As simple as that sounds, extends their harvest. And so you're you're harvesting that morning, sometimes you're harvesting, especially in the summertime, very early before the sun comes up, and they're going to that farmer's market or they're taking it down to Nugget or Lily's or they're taking it to a restaurant that day. And if you don't have cooling and it's 105 degrees here and warm over the evenings as well, you, you're, and you don't sell all of it. You don't have the ability to, uh, to sell it the next day or the next day or the next day. And yes, it can be then distributed to the food banks, which is something that all of our farmers do, and we're very proud of that. But it, it doesn't return as much money back into the farmer's pocket. So, so the infrastructure is critical. The transportation is critical. Uh, not having to go too far to markets. Uh, farmers markets, uh, as 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 Bowden was saying, it's a lot of time for farmers. A lot of time, um, and not always a great return. And people people think that farmers markets are this this really great place for for farmers to to uh, make a lot of money. What you do get is you get the money right there. You get the cash right there. That's obviously really important <laughs> from a cash flow perspective. But in terms of your, if you can start looking at the amount of hours that it takes especially if you're a one or two person operation, it is uh, it doesn't usually pencil very well. So that, that infrastructure, the additional infrastructure, the ability to partner, uh, whether it's for, with, the where, um, with the warehouse or a wholesale opportunity or a restaurant or a grocery store and go direct quickly as possible, but having the coolers, to having that is, is huge. It makes a huge difference for the bottom line. So we have another question from Twitter about the waste end of the infrastructure. We haven't really addressed that. I mean, hopefully there's as little waste as possible, possible if it's getting to you, Blake, but there is clearly a lot of, we know a lot of waste in the system. Do you guys want to address that? Is it, how expensive is that piece of it? Uh, what's happening with compost in, in this area? I know it's, it's a little bit of a taboo topic sometimes for folks to <laughs> admit that I there's can, waste. I can speak to the retail side of it. 3% of our sales, 3% of our sales are deemed, that product is deemed not so. That doesn't mean it's not okay to eat, but it means that it doesn't look visually appealing, customers won't buy it, um, and in some cases, you know, there's perishability that uh, product can't be sold after. There's rules and laws around food safety that govern that as well. Um, the product that is uh, okay to consume, is certainly, um, we 
getting back through the channel. It's very inefficient. Uh, it's very costly to do. Um, and the, that which is not is, is composted and used in recycling. We have partnerships around the city, um, uh, including one with Davis, where uh, uh, the city of Davis and the university, where you know, it was experimentally composted into different things. Some of it is used for uh, livestock, but it's still safe to eat, uh, certainly for a uh, food chain for animals. Uh, some of it is converted into uh, alternative fuels. You actually buy gas, methane gas that's converted into natural gas from composted food products that we, uh, we don't use. I think Mary touched on a really important point. 